one, three in the morning. I realize this second, then this one, then the next. I drop the balance sheet for each minute. And why all this? Because I was born. It is a special type of sleeplessness that produces the indictment of birth. Ever since I was born, that since has a resonance so dreadful to my ears it becomes unendurable. There is a kind of knowledge that strips whatever you do of weight and scope. For such knowledge, everything is without basis except itself. Pure to the point of abhorring even the notion of an object, it translates that extreme science according to which doing or not doing something comes down to the same thing and is accompanied by an equally extreme satisfaction. That of being able to rehearse each time the discovery that any gesture performed is not worth defending, that nothing is enhanced by the merest vestige of substance, that reality falls within the province of lunacy. Such knowledge deserves to be called posthumous. It functions as if the knower were alive and not alive, a being and the memory of a being. It's already in the past, he says about all he achieves, even as he achieves it, thereby forever destitute of the present. We do not rush toward death. We flee the catastrophe of birth, survivors struggling to forget it. Fear of death is merely the projection into the future of a fear which dates back to our first moment of life. We are reluctant, of course, to treat birth as a scourge, has it not been inculcated as the sovereign good? Have we not been told that the worst came at the end, not at the outset of our lives? Yet evil, the real evil, is behind, not ahead of us. What escaped Jesus did not escape Buddha. If three things did not exist in the world, O disciples, the perfect one would not appear in the world. And ahead of old age and death, he places the fact of birth, source of every infirmity, every disaster. We can endure any truth, however destructive, provided it replaces everything, provided it affords as much fatality as the hope for which it substitutes. I do nothing, granted, but I see the hours pass, which is better than trying to fill them. No need to elaborate works. Merely say something that can be murmured in the ear of a drunkard or a dying man. Nothing is a better proof of how far humanity has regressed than the impossibility of finding a single nation, a single tribe, among whom birth still provokes mourning and lamentations. To defy heredity is to defy billions of years, to defy the first cell. There is a God at the outset, if not at the end, of every joy. Never comfortable in the immediate, I am lured only by what precedes me, what distances me from here, the numberless moments when I was not the non-born. Physical need of dishonor, how I should have liked to be the executioner's son. What right have you to pray for me? I need no intercessor. I shall manage alone. The prayers of a wretch I might accept, but no one else's, not even a saint's. I cannot bear your bothering about my salvation. If I apprehend salvation and flee it, your prayers are merely an indiscretion. Invest them elsewhere. In any case, we do not serve the same gods. If mine are impotent, there is every reason to believe yours are no less so. Even assuming they are as you imagine them, they would still lack the power to cure me of a horror older than my memory. What misery a sensation is. Ecstasy itself, perhaps, is nothing more. Unmaking Decreating is the only task man may take upon himself. 
if he aspires, as everything suggests, to distinguish himself from the Creator. I know that my birth is fortuitous, a laughable accident, and yet, as soon as I forget myself, I behave as if it were a capital event, indispensable to the progress and equilibrium of the world. To have committed every crime but that of being a father. As a general rule, men expect disappointment. They know they must not be impatient, that it will come sooner or later, that it will hold off long enough for them to proceed with their undertakings of the moment. The disabused man is different. For him, disappointment occurs at the same time as the deed. He has no need to await it. It is present. By freeing himself from succession, he has devoured the possible and rendered the future superfluous. I cannot meet you in your future, he says to the others. We do not have a single moment in common, because for him the whole of the future is already here. When we perceive the end in the beginning, we move faster than time. Illumination, that lightning disappointment, affords a certitude which transforms disillusion into deliverance. I disentangle myself from appearances, yet I am snarled in them nonetheless, or rather, I am halfway between these appearances and that which invalidates them, that which has neither name nor content, that which is nothing and everything. I shall never take the decisive step outside them. My nature forces me to drift, to remain forever in the equivocal, and if I were to attempt a clean break in one direction or the other, I should perish by my salvation. My faculty for disappointment surpasses understanding. It is what lets me comprehend Buddha, but also what keeps me from following him. What we can no longer commiserate with counts for nothing, no longer exists. We realize why our past so quickly stops being ours and turns into history, something which no longer concerns anyone. In the deepest part of yourself, aspire to be as dispossessed, as lamentable as God. True contact between beings is established only by mute presence, by apparent non-communication, by that mysterious and wordless exchange which resembles inward prayer. What I know at sixty, I knew as well at twenty. Forty years of a long, a superfluous labor of verification. I am for the most part so convinced that everything is lacking in basis, consequence, justification, that if someone dared to contradict me, even the man I most admire, he would seem to me a charlatan or a fool. Even in childhood I watched the hours flow, independent of any reference, any action, any event, the disjunction of time from what was not itself, its autonomous existence, its special status, its empire, its tyranny. I remember quite clearly that afternoon when, for the first time, confronting the empty universe, I was no more than a passage of moments reluctant to go on playing their proper parts. Time was coming unstuck from being, at my expense. Unlike Job, I have not cursed the day I was born. All the other days, on the contrary, I have covered with my anathemas. If death had only negative aspects, dying would be an unmanageable action. Everything exists. Nothing exists. Either formula affords a like serenity. The man of anxiety to his misfortune remains between them, trembling and perplexed, forever at the mercy of a nuance, incapable of gaining a foothold in the security of being or in the absence of being. Here on the coast of Normandy, at this hour of the morning, I needed no one. The very gull's presence bothered me, I drove them off with stones, and hearing their supernatural shrieks, 
I realized that that was just what I wanted, that only the sinister could soothe me, and that it was for such a confrontation that I had got up before dawn. In this our life, to be in life, suddenly I am struck by the strangeness of such an expression as if it applied to no one. Whenever I flag and feel sorry for my brain, I am carried away by an irresistible desire to proclaim. That is the moment I realize the paltry depths out of which rise reformers, prophets, and saviors. I long to be free, desperately free, free as the stillborn are free. If there is so much discomfort and ambiguity in lucidity, it is because lucidity is the result of the poor use to which we have put our sleepless nights. Our obsession with birth, by shifting us to a point before our past, robs us of our pleasure in the future, in the present, and even in the past. Rare are the days when, projected into post-history, I fail to witness the God's hilarity at leaving behind the human episode. What we need is an alternate vision when that of the Last Judgment no longer satisfies anyone. An idea, a being, anything which becomes incarnate loses identity, turns grotesque. Frustration of all achievement. Never quit the possible Wallow in eternal trifling. Forget to be born. The real, the unique misfortune, to see the light of day. A disaster which dates back to aggressiveness, to the seed of expansion and rage within origins, to the tendency to the worst which first shook them up. When we see someone again after many years, we should sit down facing each other and say nothing for hours, so that by means of silence our consternation can relish itself. Days of miraculous sterility. Instead of rejoicing over them, proclaiming victory, transforming this drought into a celebration, seeing it as an illustration of my fulfillment, my maturity, in short, my detachment, I let myself be invaded by spite and resentment. So tenacious is the old Adam in us, the bustling Ganae, unfit for self-effacement. I am enraptured by Hindu philosophy, whose essential endeavor is to surmount the self, and everything I do, everything I think, is only myself and the self's humiliation. While we are performing an action, we have a goal, performed, the action has no more reality for us than the goal we were seeking. Nothing of much consequence here, no more than a game. But some of us are conscious of this game in the course of the action. We experience the conclusion in the premises, the achieved in the virtual. We undermine seriousness by the very fact that we exist. The vision of non-reality, of universal default, is the product of an everyday sensation and a sudden frisson. Everything is a game. Without such a revelation, the sensation we haul through our usual lives would not have that characteristic stamp our metaphysical experiences require to be distinguished from their imitations, our discomforts. For every discomfort is only an abortive metaphysical experience. When we have worn out the interest we once took in death, when we realize we have nothing more to gain from it, we fall back on birth. We turn to a much more inexhaustible abyss. At this very moment, I am suffering. As we say in French, j'ai mal. This event, crucial for me, is non-existent, even inconceivable for anyone else, for everyone else except for God, if that word can have a meaning. We hear on all sides that if everything is pointless, to do well whatever it is you're doing is not. 
Yet it is, even so. To reach this conclusion, and to endure it, you need ply no trade, or, at most, a king's, say, Solomon's. I react like everyone else, even like those I most despise, but I make up for it by deploring every action I commit, good or bad. Where are my sensations? They have melted into me. And what is this me, this self, but the sum of these evaporated sensations? Extraordinary and null. These two adjectives apply to the sexual act and consequently to everything resulting from it. To life, first of all. Lucidity is the only vice which makes us free, free in a desert. As the years pass, the number of those we can communicate with diminishes. When there is no longer anyone to talk to, at last we will be as we were before stooping to a name. Once we reject lyricism, to blacken a page becomes an ordeal. What's the use of writing in order to say exactly what we had to say? We cannot consent to be judged by someone who has suffered less than ourselves, and since each of us regards himself as an unrecognized Job, I dream of an ideal confessor to tell everything to, spill it all. I dream of a blasé saint. After all the ages of dying, the living must have learned the trick. How else explain how the insect, the rodent, and man himself have managed, after a little fuss, to do it so properly? Paradise was unendurable. Otherwise the first man would have adapted to it. This world is no less so, since here we regret paradise or anticipate another one. What to do, where to go. Do nothing and go nowhere. Easy enough. Health is certainly a good thing, but those who possess it have been denied the opportunity of realizing it, for self-conscious health is either compromised or about to be. Since no one delights in his absence of infirmities, we may speak without exaggeration of a just punishment of the healthy. Some have misfortunes, others obsessions. Which are worse off? Don't be fair to me. I can do without everything but the tonic of injustice. All is suffering. Modernized, the Buddhist expression runs, all is nightmare. Thereby, Nirvana, whose mission now is to end a much more widespread torment, is no longer a recourse reserved to the few, but becomes as universal as nightmare itself. What is that one crucifixion compared to the daily kind any insomniac endures? I was walking late one night along a tree-lined path. A chestnut fell at my feet. The noise it made as it burst, the resonance it provoked in me, and an upheaval out of all proportion to this insignificant event thrust me into miracle, into the rapture of the definitive, as if there were no more questions, only answers. I was drunk on a thousand unexpected discoveries, none of which I could make use of. This is how I nearly reached the supreme, but instead... I went on with my walk. We tell our troubles to someone only to make him suffer, to make him assume them for himself. If we wanted to win him over, we would admit none but abstract worries, the only kind those who love us are eager to hear. I do not forgive myself for being born. It is as if, creeping into this world, I had profaned a mystery, betrayed some momentous pledge, committed a fault of nameless gravity. Yet, in a less assured mood, birth seems a calamity I would be miserable not having known. 
thought is never innocent, for it is pitiless, it is aggressive, it helps us burst our bonds. Were we to suppress what is evil and even demonic in thought, we should have to renounce the very concept of deliverance. The surest way of not being deceived is to undermine one certainty after the next, yet the fact remains that everything that matters was accomplished outside doubt. For a long time, always in fact, I have known that life here on earth is not what I needed and that I wasn't able to deal with it. For this reason, and for this reason alone, I have acquired a touch of spiritual pride so that my existence seems to me the degradation and the erosion of a psalm. Our thoughts, in the pay of our panic, are oriented toward the future, follow the trail of all fear, open out onto death. And we invert their course, we send them backward when we direct them toward birth, and force them to linger upon it. Thereby they lose even that vigor, that unappeasable tension which underlies the horror of death, and which is useful to our thoughts, if they would grow, develop, gather forth. Hence we see why, by taking a contrary trajectory, they lack spirit and are so weary. When at last they come up against their initial frontier, that they no longer have the energy to look beyond, toward the never-born. It is not my beginnings, it is the beginning that matters to me. If I bump into my birth into a minor obsession, it is because I cannot grapple with the first moment of time. Every individual discomfort leads back, ultimately, to a cosmogonic discomfort, each of our sensations expiating that crime of the primordial sensation by which being crept out of somewhere. Though we may prefer ourselves to the universe, we nonetheless loathe ourselves much more than we suspect. If the wise man is so rare a phenomenon, it is because he seems unshaken by the aversion which, like all beings, he must feel for himself. No difference between being and non-being, if we apprehend them with the same intensity. Nescience is the basis of everything. It creates everything by an action repeated every moment. It produces this and any world, since it continually takes for real what in fact is not. Nescience is the tremendous mistake that serves as the basis of all our truths. It is older and more powerful than all the gods combined. This is how we recognize the man who has tendencies toward an inner quest. He will set failure above any success. He will even seek it out, Unconsciously, of course. This is because failure, always essential, reveals us to ourselves, permits us to see ourselves as God sees us, whereas success distances us from what is most inward in ourselves, and indeed in everything. There was a time when time did not yet exist. The rejection of birth is nothing but the nostalgia for this time before time. I think of so many friends who are no more, and I pity them. Yet they are not so much to be pitied, for they have solved every problem, beginning with the problem of death. In the fact of being born, there is such an absence of necessity that when you think about it a little more than usual, you are left, ignorant how to react, with a foolish grin. Two kinds of mind, daylight and nocturnal. They have neither the same method nor the same morality. In broad daylight, you watch yourself. In the dark, you speak out. The salutary or awkward consequences of what he thinks matter little to the man who questions himself at hours when others are the prey of sleep. Hence he meditates upon the bad luck of being born without concern for the harm he can cause others or himself. After midnight, begins the intoxication of pernicious truths. As the years accumulate, we form an increasingly somber image of the future. Is this only to console ourselves for being excluded from it? 
Yes, in appearance. No, in fact. For the future has always been hideous, man being able to remedy his evils only by aggravating them, so that in each epoch existence is much more tolerable before the solution is found to the difficulties of the moment. In major perplexities, try to live as if history were done with, and to react like a monster riddled by serenity. If I used to ask myself, over a coffin, what good did it do the occupant to be born, I now put the same question about anyone alive. The emphasis on birth is no more than the craving for the insoluble carried to the point of insanity. Regarding death, I ceaselessly waver between mystery and inconsequentiality, between the pyramids and the morgue. It is impossible to feel that there was a time when we did not exist, hence our attachment to the personage we were before being born. Meditate but one hour upon the self's non-existence, and you will feel yourself to be another man, said a priest of the Japanese Kusha sect to a Western visitor. Without having frequented the Buddhist monasteries, how many times have I not lingered over the world's unreality, and hence my own? I have not become another man for that, no, but there certainly has remained with me the feeling that my identity is entirely illusory, and that by losing it I have lost nothing, except something, except everything. Instead of clinging to the fact of being born, as good sense bids, I take the risk, I turn back, I retrogress increasingly towards some unknown beginning. I move from origin to origin. Some day, perhaps, I shall manage to reach origin itself in order to rest there or be wrecked. X insults me. I am about to hit him. Thinking it over, I refrain. Who am I? Which is my real self, the self of the retort or that of the refraining? My first reaction is always energetic, the second one flabby. What is known as wisdom is ultimately only a perpetual thinking it over, i.e. non-action as first impulse. If attachment is an evil, we must look for its cause in the scandal of birth, for to be born is to be attached. Detachment, then, should apply itself to getting rid of the traces of this scandal, the most serious and intolerable of all. Amid anxiety and distress, sudden calm at the thought of the fetus one has been. At this precise moment, no reproach proceeding from men or gods can affect me. I have as good a conscience as if I had never existed. It is a mistake to believe in a direct relation between suffering reverses and being dead set against birth. Such opposition has deeper, more distant roots, and would occur even if one had only the shadow of a grievance against existence. In fact, it is never more virulent than in cases of extreme good fortune. Thracians and Bogomils, I cannot forget that I have haunted the same whereabouts as they, nor that the former wept over the newborn, and the latter, in order to justify God, held Satan responsible for the infamy of creation. During the long nights in the caves, how many hamlets must have murmured their endless monologues? For it is likely that the apogee of metaphysical torment is to be located well before that universal insipidity which followed the advent of philosophy. The obsession with birth proceeds from an exacerbation of memory, from an omnipresence of the past, as well as from a craving for the impasse, for the first impasse. No openness, hence no joy from the past, but solely from the present, and from a future emancipated from time. For years, in fact for life, to have meditated only on your last moments, only to discover when at last you approached them, that it was of no use, that the thought of death helps in everything, save in dying. 
It is our discomforts which provoke, which create consciousness. Their task accomplished, they weaken and disappear one after the other. Consciousness, however, remains and survives them without recalling what it owes to them, without even ever having known. Hence it continually proclaims its autonomy, its sovereignty, even when it loathes itself and would do away with itself. According to the rule of Saint Benedict, if a monk became proud of or merely satisfied with the task he was performing, he was to forsake it then and there. One danger not dreaded by the man who has lived in the thirst for unsatisfaction, in an orgy of remorse and disgust. If it is true that God dislikes taking sides, I should feel no awkwardness in his presence. So pleased would I be to imitate him, to be like him in everything, without opinion. To get up in the morning wash and then wait for some unforeseen variety of dread or depression. I would give the whole universe and all of Shakespeare for a grain of ataraxy. Nietzsche's great luck to have ended as he did in euphoria. Endlessly to refer to a world where nothing yet stooped to occurrence where you anticipated consciousness without desiring it, where, wallowing in the virtual, you rejoiced in the null plenitude of a self anterior to selfhood. Not to have been born, merely musing on that, what happiness, what freedom, what space.